Welcome to your gold, silver, bitcoin market update for the week ending 7th of May. Later in the video, we'll see how the mainstream media are celebrating the notion of central bank digital currencies. We'll also consider whether gold can push on to $3,000 now. So let's dive on in. Now, this channel provides global macro insights and champions the importance of sound money in a world gone crazy. So please do consider subscribing. So let's start by having a look at the gold silver prices. And it's been a very, very strong week for both precious metals here. So we can see gold up over 3.5%, silver up uh, over 3.4% putting in very, very strong gains and crucially for gold getting up above that $1,800 level. So if we now consider the macro indicators where we can see the Fed's balance sheet has hit a new all time high. Meanwhile, the DXY dollar index has weakened significantly. And of course, that's been very price supportive for the precious metals there. And so onto the gold chart where we can see that definite move uh, breaking out that above that downtrend that we've seen taking place over the last eight months or so. Crucially, as we said, it's above that $1,800 level with that key line of support there. Now, many gold bulls are pointing to the fact that it's onwards and upwards from here. Personally, I'd just like to see a uh, break of that overall downtrend uh, that the market has been in since the highs of last August. And that would take a break of around 1860 or so to actually confirm that in my eyes. And so if we look at the weekly gold chart, well, we can see that the MACD is at last making that crossover move that we've been talking about over the last few weeks. And so once again, this does look very, very positive for gold. And so Egon von Greyes is calling it though, and he's suggesting that yes, gold is now heading up to $3,000. As he declares here, gold $3,000 next as last resistance broken. And so if we have a look at the GDX uh, gold miners ETF here, we can see that we've uh, again seen a very positive move take place over the course of the last week with the miners ETF up over $3 this week. And once again, we can see the gold miners uh, MACD uh, the bottom of the chart here is really leading the gold price, suggesting that yes, we are likely to see gold break higher. But of course, there's various vested interests that don't want gold or silver prices to rise. So just always beware. And so moving on to silver, well, it's great to see silver trading above $27 once again. And this does seem very significant. What I'd like to see next from silver is really a break of eventually the $30 mark. But if we get above that $28, $30 margin, I think things could be looking very, very positive for uh, the precious metal. And just to emphasize this, uh, Tavi Costa, who always puts out some great charts, has uh, highlighted the silver to money supply ratio here. And so we can see silver divided by the M2 money supply. And as we can see, we've got that arced bottom, which appears to be firmly in place and supporting much higher silver prices. And so the impact on the gold silver ratio has been quite significant because we've been looking at 68 as a real line of resistance, um, which has really been uh, keeping metals prices in check. And so that 68 margin has now broken, as we can see, and it's closed out at around 66 this week. And so let's move it on to oil and treasury yields. And so clearly we can see that uh, the 10 year treasury yield, nominal yield, uh, on the 10 year US government bond has come down from 1.63 at last week's close to 1.58%. And of course, that is absolutely key towards driving higher metals prices. Moreover, we can see WTI oil has uh, continued to rise quite significantly, up almost $1.50 this week. And in fact, real yields have actually hit a recent low, which again really is price supportive for the precious metals. And so if we now consider the risk on and risk off indicators here, well, we can see just how the market is really emphasizing that the Fed's potential threat of tapering 
i.e. letting interest rates rise, uh, is unlikely to actually transpire. And of course, we've seen those nominal yields uh, fall, and that has ultimately meant that despite very, very disappointing uh, jobs information coming out of the US economy yesterday, that the S&P 500 continued to move further upwards, and we can see it's up over half a percent in the last week, while the Vanguard Utilities uh, ETF has moved downwards this last week, really emphasizing that there is a movement taking place back towards risk assets. However, the TLT 20 plus year Treasury bond ETF, uh, which is of course said to hold safe US government bond assets, uh, is up 0.43% this week. But overall, we're clearly seeing that the market is symbolizing uh, a risk on atmosphere to maintain. And to emphasize this, well, we're seeing the gold to lumber ratio that we've just been tracking over the last few weeks has moved dramatically lower to 1.1. It was 1.18 last week. And this is a level that we haven't seen since around about 2007 or so. And we all know what happened thereafter, of course. Meanwhile, copper has also continued to uh, move much higher and has now hit a historic high. So here the FT is reporting that copper hits record high with demand expected to rise sharply. The US and Europe were becoming significant factors in the consumption of copper for the first time in decades. Uh, before it's effectively been a China only story. That is changing fast. Concerns about the long term supply of copper due to lack of investment by large miners has also pushed up prices. There are only a few large projects in development, while most of the world's easily produced copper has already been mined. The current pipeline of projects likely to start producing in the next few years represents only 2.3% of forecast mine supply. So this uh, really does seem very, very significant. And this is well down on previous cycles, including 2010 to 2013, when it reached 12%. And so just to emphasize this, we can consider the copper gold ratio because we've seen gold move higher and we've seen copper move higher. And we can see that on this copper gold ratio, where copper is of course demanded because of its industrial uh, use case uh, and is, is really about a reflation recovery trade, we can see that this ratio has been moving much, much higher. Whereas gold is, of course, a safe haven asset at times of uh, economic concern and economic distress. And of course, you all know that we're in the midst of one of those times right now. But the market is signaling that we are likely to see this melt up situation continue. And so on to Bitcoin. Well, Bitcoin's had a good week uh, back up. Uh, towards two and a half percent this week and quite significantly as we can see on the chart here seems to be breaking through a slightly worrisome arc that had been forming there suggesting a potential top of uh, the cryptocurrency so that's quite a significant development there but we're also seeing that uh, the ethereum bitcoin uh, relationship where we take ethereum and divide that by the bitcoin price well that's now moved up to uh, where one Ethereum is worth 6.1% uh, of a Bitcoin or so. Uh, so we are seeing other cryptocurrencies actually outperforming Bitcoin. And just to highlight this, and just to emphasize that, we can see that Bitcoin's overall dominance of the cryptocurrency market has fallen from a high earlier this year of 74 or so, uh, down to 45% or so of the overall cryptocurrency market. And I am expecting that to move lower. And we can see that's exactly what happened during the last four year cycle back in 2017, 2018. But perhaps one of the craziest things and really a key symbol of uh, outright speculation that's taking place is, of course, Dogecoin. Uh, Dogecoin has no uh, limit to its supply, but has continued to actually rise in price, as we can see here, as uh, people were making more and more speculative bets on this currency going ever higher. And it is now the fourth largest cryptocurrency by market capital 
quite staggering. And so this week, The Economist is championing the CBDCs, the central bank digital currencies that will transform finance. And this is their front cover this week. Just looking at this article, I thought there were a number of uh, very interesting points to note. So I've just highlighted those here. The most revolutionary development is the creation of government digital currencies, which typically aim to let people deposit funds directly with a central bank, bypassing conventional lenders. So what need is there for a small, local, decentralized banking system? Well, of course, there is no need with central bank digital currencies. Moreover, The Economist goes on to actually state openly that it shifts power from individuals to the state. Well, don't we know it? And that is exactly why we are making the choices that we are in terms of investing in gold, silver, and personally, I like certain privacy coins such as Monero, which hit a new all time high this week, and Pirate Chain. And so there we go. I hope that's been a useful roundup of what we've seen this last week. Thanks ever so much for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye bye.